Hi everybody, um, welcome back to our next video lecture, Chapter 4, the amino acids and the primary structure of proteins. So before we delve right into this, I want to clear up some terminology. So proteins can also be referred to as polypeptides or peptides, and I'm sure you've heard these terms before. However, each term can designate the relative size of the protein that we're discussing. For instance, peptides typically refer to small polymers of amino acids, typically 10 or less amino acids, where polypeptides are sort of the intermediate designation that describe a poly or polymer from 10 to 40 um, amino acids in length, where proteins typically refer to very large polymers or proteins, anything 40 amino acids or higher. So now let's ask about why do we care about proteins? Well, we care about proteins because they govern almost every cellular process um, from cell-to-cell -cell information relay, to catalyzing metabolic processes, to structural and locomotive functions of the cell. And these types of proteins a cell expresses is what differentiates our various tissues and organs in our bodies. And then the ways in which these proteins misbehave in disease or disorder are of vital importance in understanding the physiological processes that go away and can help us develop new drugs and treatments in order to alleviate the disorder or the disease. So as you will later learn, the functions of a protein is directly related to the structure and structure is directly related to the way in which various amino acids are strung together in a linear fashion, making up the protein. So when we meet in class next, we're going to take the content from this lecture video and apply it to section two in the workbook, Amino Acids and the Primary Structure of Proteins. This activity will allow us an opportunity to practice determining the charge of an amino acid at a given pH. Um, based on the acid-base characteristics of amino acids. It will allow us also to determine the isoelectric point, or the PI, of a small peptide, which is the pH at which the peptide has a zero charge. And it can allow us to identify the peptide bond and describe its structural features while applying information processing skills to draw conclusions about chemical characteristics of complex molecules. So, Keep all of that in the back of your mind as we navigate through this video lecture, and I will see you guys in class. Here are our learning objectives for this chapter. Again, be sure to review these objectives before and after studying the material as you prepare for the exam and for life after the test. Do recognize um, that the first of the first three learning objectives, we have recognized the 20 amino acids by structure, name, and shorthand. That means you do need to memorize the different amino acid structures, their full name, and their three-letter notation. You also need to be able to categorize each of these amino acids into one of the three categories that we will discuss in just a minute. Here we see the basic structure of an amino acid. At the center, we have a tetrahedral alpha carbon bound to a carboxylic group, an amino group, a hydrogen, and an R group. The R group, or the functional group, is what distinguishes the various amino acids found in nature from one another. You may also be asking yourself, why are they called acids? This is because amino acids themselves are weak acids are weak acids, and at physiological pH, or 7.3, the carboxylic group is deprotonated, giving a negative charge, and the amino group is protonated, giving it a positive charge. Because the amino acids now carry both a positive and negative charge, it is said to be a zero ion. Amino acids are covalently linked together through a condensation reaction or the elimination of water to form peptide bonds. The N terminus of one amino acid and the C terminus of another amino acid are what link together to form the peptide bond. Typically, a protein sequence is described starting from the N terminus of the polymer and ending at the C terminus. Now, although all amino acids have the same basic structure, the distinguishing R group can give each amino acid different physical and chemical properties. Of the 20 common amino acids seen in nature, we are able to categorize each amino acid into one of three basic categories. 
The first category is hydrophobic amino acids. These are amino acids that contain a variety of shapes and sizes in their R groups that are all nonpolar in nature. Some are very bulky, such as the phenyl R group of phenylalanine, and some are much more compact, such as the methyl R group of alanine. But as you can see, each of the R groups are hydrophobic in nature. The other hydrophobic amino acids, or nonpolar as described in our text, can be seen in Table 4.1. Here we see glycine, the smallest of the amino acid R groups with a hydrogen. Alanine, valine, leucine, and isoleucine all have aliphatic hydrocarbon R groups. Methionine has a thioether. Proline has a cyclic pyrrolidine side group that the R group actually connects back to the backbone amino group. While phenylalanine has a phenyl R group and tryptophan has an indole. Both of these R groups are aromatic, so they are not just hydrophobic, but also pretty bulky. Our next category comprises amino acids that are hydrophilic, but carry no formal charge, such as serine and glutamine. As seen in Table 4.1, serine and threonine both contain hydro hydroxyl groups. Asparginine and glutamine have amide-bearing R groups. Tyrosine has an aromatic phenolic, and cysteine has a thiol group capable of forming a disulfide bridge with other cysteines. We're going to come back to this guy in just a little bit. The third and final category is comprised of hydrophilic and charged amino acids. These amino acids, such as aspartate or lysine, have functional groups that can act as weak acids conjugate bases and carry a formal charge on their R group at physiological pH. Lysine, arginine, and histidine all have additional protonated amino groups that carry a positive charge at physiological pH. Aspartic acid and glutamic acid both have additional carboxylic acids in their R groups that are deprotonated and carry a negative charge at physiological pH. If you look at the far right column on this table, you will see the pKa's for each of the ionizable hydrogens in the R groups of these amino acids. Notice that histidine's R group pKa, 6.04, is relatively close to the physiological pH of 7. Because of this, it is possible that both the protonated and deprotonated forms of histidine are present in equili equilibrium within the cell. This will come into play later on when we discuss various enzymatic mechanisms. Overall, an understanding of the physical and chemical properties of the various R groups of common amino acids can allow us to make predictions on protein folding, structure, function, and molecular interactions. For instance, proteins tend to fold in ways in which more hydrophilic groups are on the outside and hydrophobic groups are buried on the inside as to shield themselves from water. While the charged amino acids can participate in stabilizing ionic bonds to bridge and stabilize various sections of the folded protein. And we will come back to this when we start discussing secondary and tertiary structure of proteins. For instance, Cysteine is commonly used to form covalent disulfide bridges through an oxidation reduction reaction that can stabilize tertiary or quaternary structures by securing, by securing various amino acid segments of the protein together in three-dimensional space that may be far from each other in the primary sequence. Because of the basic structure to amino acids, Oh, I should say, because of the skeletal structure of amino acids, the alpha carbon in the amino acid backbone is chiral, meaning that the various R groups off the chiral carbon are all different. This applies to all amino acids except glycine, which has two hydrogens bound to the alpha carbon. As you may recall from organic one, 
the ways in which these R groups are arranged spatially can give chiral centers different optical behaviors and are designated as either L, lever rotary, or D, dextrorotary. And the two together are called enantiomers of each other. While the ability for enantiomers to rotate plane polarized light in different directions is an interesting phenomenon that we can utilize in spectroscopic studies, the fact that they exist in nature in almost stereospecific exclusivity is of great biological importance. In eukaryotes, nearly all amino acids are present in only the L conformation while prokaryotic amino acids, especially in the bacterial cell wall, can be found in the D conformation. Since most enzymes, which are proteins themselves, can only act on stereospecific substrates, a eukaryotic peptidase that targets L amino acids is unable to degrade peptides comprised of D amino acids, which can be found on the prokaryotic cell wall. While nature is very, very good at producing enantiomerically pure products, meaning they will produce only one of the pairs, this continues to be a major challenge for organic chemists, especially when we try to design drugs that interact with a protein target, such as an enzyme. Often, as we see with ibuprofen, only one of the two enantiomers is biologically active while the other is inactive. Unfortunately, during most of our organic syntheses, when we synthesize ibuprofen, we end up making a racemic mixture or a mixture that is comprised of 50% D and 50% L. But in the instance of ibuprofen, one of the in antiomers is biologically active while the other is inert and causes no harm. Sometimes, however, we find that the other enantiomer can be detrimental, as we see with thalidomide. Thalidomide was a drug developed and prescribed in the early 1960s to pregnant women to help treat nausea during the first trimester of pregnancy. While the active enantiomer was highly effective and had minimal side effects, it was soon later discovered that the other enantiomeric pair caused severe birth defects in the fetus, such as missing limbs. Thousands of children were born with severe defects and only about half survived until adulthood. Even though this drug is now banned for the treatment of nausea in um, pregnant women, as of today, the FDA has granted approval for the use of thalidomide for the treatment of newly diagnosed myeloma patients in combination with other chemotherapeutics. The side chains of amino acids can be further modified and are often sites of chemical reactions such as phosphorylation, carboxylation, hydroxylation, methylation, and acetylation. These modifications may occur immediately following translation and are called post-translational modifications and are often required to make the protein fully functional. As you will see later on when we start talking about glycolysis and other metabolic processes, we'll see that the phosphorylation of certain enzymes is required to activate or deactivate the enzyme in certain processes. These modifications can also be used as a means to target and tag a protein for degradation in the cell. We will also see later on how proteins can become glycosylated where sugars are covalently attached as a means of cell-to-cell -cell recognition. In a few cases, amino acids themselves can also serve as neurotransmitters or hormones. Often, these are intermediates of amino acid metabolism, and we will revisit these specialized molecules later on in the term. So this is all I have for you for this lecture. It's a relatively short lecture. Um, I do suggest that you spend some time um, committing the 20 common amino acids to memory and also practice drawing um, some titration curves using 
various amino acids as weak bases or weak acids. Um, remember these amino acids are going to be polyprotic, either two ionizable R groups or if you're looking at the amino acids with charged polar side chains, then they're going to have three different PKAs or three different ionizable groups. You're expected to know the three letter combination, the R group structure, and the PKA of the R group itself. The PKA of the alpha carboxylate and the alpha amino groups are all pretty similar from amino acid to amino acid. It's really the R group PKAs that we need to commit to memory. I will see you guys in class next time.